usually people are very surprised about the transition and the surprise hangs on two things. Firstly, they're surprised that someone would sacrifice the status and the money associated with the big commercial legal career. And secondly, they're often surprised by the move from words into numbers. But in a way, I think that that view underestimates people because we all know that a satisfying, rewarding job is really important. So if you can have the status of money as well, that's lovely. But from my point of view, it wasn't such a huge compromise to make when it became clear to me over time that teaching was something that I really felt called to do. The thing is, when I left school, I had really all available options open to me. So I was very fortunate. And teaching at that stage was something that was intrinsically attractive to me. It was something that I knew would be very enjoyable and rewarding. But I, then there were lots of other things that I wanted to do that equally seemed very attractive. And at that stage, I remember very clearly going through the calculus in my head and thinking, well, if all other, being th all other things being equal, I'll take the one that gives me money and status as well. That would be nice. And that was pretty much everything except for teaching. <laughs> um, but over time, as much fun as I was having, and I really did enjoy my legal career, I really started to feel that teaching was something that I felt passionately about and really wanted to pursue. So at that point, the money and status faded in comparison. So it was always just the icing on the cake. And when it came down to it, um, I wanted some really good cake. I think it's possible and I think this is something that we do need to look at because there I was, the school leaver with all sorts of options and I considered, actively considered teaching, felt an attraction to it and yet rejected it. And we, we do need to look at that. One of the things that I think we miss is that the best advertisement for teaching is the practice of it. Actually doing it is inspiring and rewarding and fun. And yet, at the moment, we have a system where, in public schools at least, you are not allowed to set foot in a classroom and engage in teaching until you have a formal teaching qualification. We're preaching to the converted. The only people who get to experience the best of teaching and learn how exciting it is are the ones who've already committed to it. Uh, if you look at the US and the UK, they've got schemes where at the end of doing your degree you take a gap year and you go into schools and, and you experience that, that uh, uh, you experience teaching. And whether or not we structured it the same, I think the, the, the best attraction we have is to get people into it. Anybody with any sort of inclination or interest, we've got to get them to try it. And so having a barrier at the start is quite destructive, I think. The other thing is that we need to make sure once young teachers are in, that it is a good experience for them. Now, I couldn't have had a more cushioned entry into teaching than I did at Barker College because they have all sorts of policies which are designed to nurture young teachers. For instance, um, there's a policy that they have under the headship of, of Dr Rod Kefford where the uh, first year out teachers are given a full-time salary with an 80% teaching load. Now the first years of teaching are tremendously hard, very intense, you're unfamiliar with the curriculum, you're refining your classroom management techniques, you have no reputation when the kids walk into the room, so you've got all of that to establish. That it's a very stressful time if you can reduce the pressure by just providing some teaching relief for the first year. I think that goes an enormous way to supporting inexperienced teachers. That's what I think all schools should be doing. Uh, secondly, at Barker, you have senior staff doing what they're supposed to do. They are the ones that coordinate subjects, that coordinate year groups, that manage the pastoral care programs. They're the ones who are designing the curriculum do documents and so on. Yet the research shows that large numbers of very inexperienced teachers in a lot of schools are asked to take on these, these burdens and they're not prepared for it. Naturally, everyone feels stressed when they are not qualified to do something and are asked to do it, and then they burn out very quickly. So I think we, we really need to, to make sure in all schools that structures are in place to support young staff. And we do have a problem because in the next four years, 40% of the existing teaching workforce comes up for retirement. 
And if we lose that body of experienced teachers and that work shifts onto younger teachers who are not yet appropriately skilled, we risk burning out and losing really talented candidates. So I think that's a problem. And I would love to see, for instance, a government policy where they kept that experience in the system a bit longer by offering part-time mentoring positions. I think a lot of retiring committed teachers who enjoyed their career and value their profession would be interested in that. And you could have them coming in, working in with small groups of, of new teachers, providing them that support. And of course, it's an additional bonus if it's outside the existing school structures, because then you're not having to confess your weaknesses to your boss. So I, I think yeah, those kinds of ideas are what we need to look at in order to make sure that we firstly get people in and we are more flexible about allowing them to see the, the teaching profession for what it is, which is exciting, rewarding and wonderful. And then once they're in, we need to make sure that they're looked after. Well, I, I really believe in public education and, and think it's a, a tremendous social good. And so my first choice was to try and teach in the public system, but I approached the uh, New South Wales Department of Education, said I'd like to be a maths teacher. They said, have you got a dip ed? I said, no, and that was the end of the conversation. There is no flexibility, no discussion, no pathways into teaching provided to go into the public sector. And that is a real problem because if you think about, if we're now talking about people like myself who are considering a career change, if, if you have to get a dip ed before you can set foot in a classroom, not only do you need to pay your hex fees and study alongside your work, which is a challenge, it's quite burdensome, but you have the prax, eight to 12 weeks, where you have to take time off work and go and teach unpaid in another school before you can even start. Now, for a lot of people, that's a deal breaker. If you had any ambivalence, and particularly if we're looking at the best and the brightest, who by definition have a whole range of opportunities open to them, that's a real problem. Then, even now that I'm qualified, I would quite like to go into the public school system, but again in New South Wales we have the transfer system. That may be being dismantled, not, not clear yet what's going to happen with it, but at the moment I need to put my name down on a list, take a ticket and wait. And there are about 15 categories of people who have priority over me. And if a job vacancy comes up at a school nearby, I'm not free to apply for it until all of those people have rejected it. And then they get down the list and then I will get the job or not based on my position in the queue. I don't have any chance to argue that I would be the best qualified person to do it. This is not how normal jobs are structured. And the only way I can expedite that process is to take a position in a remote or very disadvantaged school which is feasible, if not necessarily attractive, when you are a 21-year-old graduate. But if you have a house and a mortgage and your children are settled in local schools and your spouse has a job somewhere nearby, again, that's a deal breaker. So that makes it very difficult for career changes to enter into it. Plus, in the private school system, they were prepared to recognise that after all my experiences as a lawyer, as a, a, a lecturer, I brought something more than your 21-year-old graduate and they put me a few ring, rungs up the pay scale. If I were now to go into the public school sector, they will not recognise that and I would actually once again make a very substantial salary uh, compromise in order to be permitted to teach in the public school system. So there are a lot of structural problems with the public sector, but then even in the private sector there are rigidities. For instance, in most professions, it's demanding, you have long hours, all of those things. But if you know six months ahead of time that there's an important event that you need to attend, you can arrange your work around it and get that time off. And teaching's not like that. School holidays are wonderful, and they're particularly good if you've got children. But the during term, your hours are very rigid. Now, Barker, for instance, has a much more uh, enlightened policy where it says, you have to be available for teaching and meetings and we expect you to be there most of the time. But if you want to do two hours of work at home tonight and use a gap in your timetable to do something important to you, that's fine. And those kind of, of more flexible creative management practices are not the norm. So I think again, if we're trying to make 
the career change attractive. The pay packet will never do it. We have to do things creatively and flexibly to get people in. And so the, here the private sector I think does have an advantage because they can once again get people into the classroom, get them to catch the bug and then they'll put up with a lot. <laughs> but if they don't even have the chance to taste it and other barriers are, are needlessly put in the way, then uh, all schools are going to have trouble attracting them. But the more rigid, the worse the position. I have a great belief in the need for uh, teacher training, both before they enter into teaching and as an ongoing thing. My concerns are not as to the need to train teachers, but the way in which we structure and deliver it. My starting point is that teaching is a practical skill. We all know the difference between the you know, mathematical guru who delivers appalling lectures. We know the difference between knowledge of, 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 of subject and the ability to communicate it. And to my mind, teaching is a practical skill. Now, if I want to be a good spin bowler, I can go and spend time in the nets and I can practice it myself and have other people give me feedback and watch people do it. Or I can read a book, maybe even one by Shane Warne, but a really good book about spin bowling. But no matter how good that book is, fundamentally it's a practical skill. And if I have to choose between someone who spent time in the nets or read the book, I'm going to go for the person who spent the time in the nets. If that's the case, if teaching is a practical skill that you primarily learn by doing, then it doesn't make sense to me that we've located all of the teacher training in universities. Because universities teach you how to think, not how to do. That's what they do. And the paradigm is all wrong. So this came through very clearly when I was doing my dip ed. There was a real confusion of purpose. One of the first assignments we had to do was discuss our philosophy of education. And at a tertiary academic level, you would expect to say, here's an interesting idea, research it, discuss it. But it seemed to be put in much more practical terms because we were told to pretend that we were head of department. Of course, none of the students had actually even been a teacher, let alone head of department. We had to pretend we were head of department and write a speech which we would deliver to a group of parents of incoming year sevens and in that context. So it seemed to be trying to dress it up as a practical exercise and some sort of simulation of something that we might do with a focus on personal reflection. So I think that's a reasonable thing to do, although I felt it was a little bit cheesy <laughs> at tertiary level, but there we go. When I, I, I thought this was going to be great because I like writing speeches and I had a well-developed philosophy of education. It's a doddle, I thought. But I came very close to failing, which was a new experience for me at university um, because uh, the, the marker had very little to say about the content but heavily penalised me because I hadn't used formal academic language. And so having set it up as a kind of practical, vocational, realistic exercise, they then judged it as if it were a formal, academic, intellectual process. There was a real confusion of, pro of purpose which went through my training at the university and, and I think that underlines the, the fact that, the, that we are positioning the training fundamentally in the wrong place. And then the other thing is that if you look at, I'll restrict my comments here to the dip air because that's what I'm most familiar with, but I think mutatis mutandi, it, it approaches, it applies to most other teaching qualifications. Typically a dip ed is one year, 25% of it is prax, and that's great. Prax are invaluable, they are what makes it. But of course they're delivered by teachers in schools, so I don't think really the universities can take much credit for that. Of the 75% that remains, You've got 25% which is what we call curriculum method subjects and these are subjects which are specifically directed at how does one teach history, how does one teach mathematics and, and it specifically looks at issues in your own subject. Now my experience of those was, was not particularly fruitful but I think on the whole talking to colleagues 
those, those subjects which are very practically and oriented and narrowly focused on the subject and how you would do it are generally quite well regarded. Students enjoy them and feel that they get something out of it. But 50% of the course, the remainder, is in fact abstract theory and ideology. And it sometimes is dressed up as if it has practical relevance. But in fact, it's not. Let me give you an example. This was the, the crowning glory of my, my dip ed. It was the final assignment. And the subject was asking us to consider inclusive education. And that's how do we meet the needs of students with, di with disabilities within a mainstream school setting. And this is of vital importance. It's, it's a very important thing to do. And it's obviously a great opportunity to talk about practical things. What would you actually do? But it ended up as an exercise in ideology because we were given a hypothetical, a student who was 17 years old, severely autistic, couldn't talk, was not clear whether they were able to communicate in any meaningful way, prone to self-harm and violent behaviour, couldn't stand bright, noise, uh, bright lights and loud noises. And we were asked to explain how we would incorporate the student into our normal teaching of students of this age group. So this seemed to me so absurd that I contacted the lecturer and said, I'm normally teaching integral and differential calculus. Do you, do you really mean this? And this was confirmed and so I had to go forth. I asked a friend of mine who has a, a son with autism of similar severity and she just shook her head in despair and said, this kid needs to learn how to butter toast and buy a bus ticket, not sit in a classroom with other students doing calculus. It's, it's meaningless. But I had tried before challenging the assumptions behind the assignments that we were set and had failed. Again, a, a new experience for me in the academic arena. Um, so I had learnt very early on that one does not do that. One has to accept the ide ideology that is presented. So I swallowed my intellectual integrity and did this nauseating exercise. And I think I got a D, a distinction, I think, pretty sure, either distinction or high distinction. So I got through it, but it, this was meaningless. I mean, it looks like it might prepare you to do something, but it doesn't. It is ideologically driven and a lot of the theory is not scientific theory. It's not about experiments that they've done about how students learn and then they compare results. A lot of the theory bears more resemblance to theory of economics, you know, sort of capitalism versus Marxism or, you know, the history wars. A lot of it is a clash at that level, which has really very limited relevance to how do we get a first year teacher competent and prepared to walk into a classroom and take command of it and enjoy that process. So my concerns are very structural about the nature of, of, of teaching qualifications rather than the idea itself that teachers should be qualified and trained. The move into teaching had been growing inside me for such a long time. I think nothing short of a voice coming out of a burning bush would actually have put me off by that stage. But I don't think that's necessarily typical. I think for a lot of people, I got phone calls when uh, I made the decision from other young lawyers saying, I've always wanted to be a maths teacher. <laughs> and they say that and yet they weren't quite ready to make the plunge. So you've got to look at other things that make it attractive. For instance, we have to make sure that the curriculum is one that's worth teaching. Now, if you look, for example, at the physics syllabus in the New South Wales HSC, which was dumbed down six, I don't know, a couple of years ago, first of all, you had an exodus of experienced, committed teachers who didn't want to teach a, a version of physics where most of the hard calculations were taken out. And they were now asking students to write essays on gravity or the social implications of optic fibre. This is not what they signed up for. It's not what they wanted to do. But then if you consider a, a talented young physics graduate who loves their discipline and is considering entry into teaching, what's in it for them to go into a field where they have to teach essays on the sociology of optic fibre as opposed to conveying a love and passion for the discipline that they are highly trained in. And of course, a physics graduate in this economy 
has a smorgasbord of opportunities all over the world with pay packets to match. If we want to get someone like that into teaching, we have to make sure the subject's worthwhile. And that applies to any number of subjects. Mathematics is mine. That's undergoing a review. It, it's, it's threatening to lose a lot of its elegance and coherence under that. I can sort of put up with that. But if we get to the point where it's essays on the political impact of trigonometry, I'm out. You know, that, that, that goes against every bone, in, uh, every, that goes against everything I believe in and it compromises my intellectual integrity. I don't think it's worthwhile and uh, you can't ask people who are passionate about their disciplines to devote their life to that. So we need to make sure that the subjects at school level have a coherence and a purposefulness within the wider discipline in order to attract the best people. And the other thing that, that really struck me with my experience is the importance of, of quality school leadership. I had interviews with three different principals and two of them left me champing at the bit. I couldn't wait to get in there and to be part of the project that they had undertaken to be teaching in the environment that they had set up. And one of them had me running for the hills. I just, that was not someone I wanted to work with and I didn't want to be part of the kind of school that they ran. And so I think as a teacher, I've become much more acutely aware of the, the critical importance of the quality of school leadership. And I do have some serious concerns about what we're going to do about that. I don't think it's a problem in the sense that the, the school leaders are bad, but I, I do have concerns about the nature of the role. And this, first, this thought first occurred to me about a year or so ago when I was part of a discussion panel. And there was a Victorian school principal who was arguing very articulately and very coherently that she didn't want to be in the position of passing judgment over her colleagues. That was not how she saw her role. And this makes perfect sense on reflection when you look at the fairly limited powers of a, of a, of a, of a principal in a public school because they have very little control over budget, they have very little control over their primary resource which is staff, teachers, they have very limited role in curriculum development, uh, policy development. Within the school context they do have certain powers and they can set a tone but there are real limitations on what they can achieve. So this woman was describing her role really as sort of primus inter pares. She was you know, encouraging and where possible facilitating and supporting people, but she didn't want the responsibility and the accountability of having real power. And that makes sense within the public school context. Now if you compare that with the, with the independent schools, which are the last bastions of dictatorship in Australia, it, the, the principals in those schools have almost total control over all of those aspects. And if you then consider how do we get the best and brightest people into school leadership, and this is important because we know that quality school leaders attract and retain quality teachers. If we want to get those individuals who are driven and enthusiastic and energetic and really committed which environment is going to be the one that's attractive to them? And my hunch is it's going to be the sort of school where they can be most effective. And that means that they have to have the power to implement real change and real policies at the school level. So I have concerns that, once again, that structures within the public education system are acting as barriers to the most committed, capable, exciting candidates.